Welcome to Old Orchard Church. My name is Matt Phillip, and I'm one of the elders here, and it is my joy to lead us in worship today. Our senior pastor, Ryan Sparks, will be preaching. So I invite you to now turn your attention to our announcements, which you'll also find in the bulletin. Enrollment is at capacity with a long waiting list. We are still in need of several volunteers to make it happen. If you can help out for all or part of the week in any capacity, please speak to Kelly Mack. Congregational? Oh, we will have a congregational meeting this Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. here in the sanctuary. The main business will be for, a season, for the season to share their vision and priorities for the year. Reflected in the annual budget, budget, whatever that says. <laughs> Budget. We are expecting an we are expecting all executed an ex an excuse. An excuse members to attend. All in the fellowship are welcome. If you need child care, please let Kelly Mackey know today. Thank you, friends. Let's now prepare our hearts and our minds for worship.
When we think of ordinary time, our current moment in the church year, we might be tempted to think that nothing special is happening. We're simply getting through, going through the motions, like the expression, same old, same old. But God tells us something different about our lives. That's because we belong to Him. And so He works all things together for our salvation. And each day that you wake up is significant because the God of the universe has chosen you to help Him in His great rescue mission to the world. So today, we worship under the banner of Christ, the great reconciler of heaven and earth. We celebrate the glorious hope that one day God will undo the curse of the world's rebellion against its maker. One day, heaven and earth will be united in sweet accord. Reconciliation is the taking away of that distance and hostility that we put between ourselves and God and the bringing us into a state of friendship with Him. So I invite you now, friends of God, please stand as we call ourselves to worship. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has lavished every spiritual blessing upon us in Christ, who has made known to us the mystery of His will to unite all things, things in heaven and things on earth, in Him. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, whose power of immeasurable greatness was doubly displayed, first in the resurrection and second in the ascension of our Lord, and whose plan and purpose still stand to unite all things in Christ. The kingdom comes and all shall be well to the praise of his glorious grace.
Dear Heavenly Father, whatever hopes deferred or fulfilled, whatever pains prolonged or relieved, whatever life has given us this week, we come to you now to worship you, ultimately at peace, because you have resoundingly settled the most important question of our lives. You have reconciled us to yourself through your Son. We who had trashed our relationship with you are now brought near to you, even such that you rejoice over us as your children. We give you all glory and honor for it, and ask now that you glorify yourself by enlivening our hearts with your Spirit, that we would praise you as we ought. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. It is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. The Lord said to Abram, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land that you see I will give to you and to your offspring forever. O Lord, remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have promised, I will give to your offspring, and they shall inherit it forever. O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might, so that none is able to withstand you. Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell upon it forever. For if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly execute justice with one another, if you do not oppress the sojourner, the fatherless, or the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not go after other gods to your own harm, then I will let you dwell in this place, in the land that I gave of old to your fathers forever. Turn now, every one of you, from his evil way and evil deeds and dwell upon the land that the Lord has given to you and your fathers from of old and forever. Behold, I will take the people of Israel from the nations among which they have gone and will gather them from all around and bring them to their own land. I will save them from all the backslidings in which they have sinned and will cleanse them and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. My servant David shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall walk in my rules and be careful to obey my statutes. They shall dwell in the land that I gave to my servant Jacob, where your fathers lived. They and their children and their children's children shall dwell there forever, and David, my servant, shall be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them, and I will set them in their land and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. My dwelling place shall be with them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. 
For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. The word of the Lord. Do you desire this heavenly place, everlasting peace with our God? Psalm 15 asks, O Lord, who shall dwell on your holy hill? It then lists the high moral qualifications for those who would. If you already know that you cannot measure up to this list and that you need Jesus, the great reconciler of heaven and earth, I invite you now into this call and response prayer of confession printed in the bulletin. If you haven't believed that yet, as Paul lovingly wrote to the Corinthians, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God, even now in this prayer. From the insincerity which hinders what is good by giving it faint praise and helps what is evil by offering no protest in its presence. From a mind which dares not search into the truth for fear of consequences and believes only what is comfortable. From a heart which says, Lord, I will follow you, and then for fear of being rejected, refuses the pain of a cross. From all hidden insecurity, insincerities which we dare not acknowledge, even to ourselves. From deceit in our work and betrayal of our friends, from flattery, prudery, and all hypocrisy. Hear now what God tells us about who we are. You may be eight or eighty, but you are a new creation. Whatever lies the world has told you this week, or maybe what you've told yourself, let this truth crowd them all out. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling to the world, the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. As James Montgomery writes, when God pardons our sins, it is to remember them no more forever. When he restores us to the joy of his salvation, his face shines upon us with a beautifying love as if we had never offended him. Brothers and sisters, you are forgiven. Alleluia and amen. Let's stand and sing.
You may be seated. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Whereas you have been forsaken and hated, with no one passing through, I will make you majestic forever, a joy from age to age, you shall suck the milk of nations and shall nurse at the breasts of kings. And you shall know that I, the Lord, am your savior and your redeemer, the mighty one of Jacob. Instead of bronze, I will bring gold. And instead of iron, I will bring silver. Instead of wood, bronze. Instead of stone, iron. I will make your overseers peace and your taskmasters righteousness. Violence shall no more be heard in your land, devastation or destruction within your borders. You shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. The sun shall be no more your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light. But the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun shall go down no more, nor your moon withdraw itself, for the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of mourning shall be ended. Your people shall all be righteous. They shall possess the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I might be glorified. The least one shall become a clan, and the smallest one a mighty nation. I am the Lord. In its time, I will hasten it. Children, I invite you to come forward now as Miss Megan brings a special lesson just for you. Good morning, friends. Well, thank you, Henry. Oh, and Josie. Oh, and then some more. Let's try it again. Good morning, friends. Good morning. So, today we have a good news, bad news scenario. So, before we start, I just have a question. Does, has anyone ever said to you, I have good news and I have bad news? Which would you like first? You ever heard that before? Okay. Are any of you here good news first people? Right, save that, okay. Well, if anyone is a good news first person, I would like to hear about that because I'm so curious as to why you would want to save the bad news for last. But that's, that's, that's a different question. Okay, so we have a good news, bad news scenario today. So we'll start with the bad news because it's good to end with the good news, don't you think? So the bad news is, and I don't think you'll be surprised by this, is things are not the way they are supposed to be here in our lives on earth. Has anyone noticed that? Has anyone observed that maybe even this week? That things are not, you think, probably how God meant for them to be? And it's partly with us, with people, right? Like sometimes we might feel lonely. Do you think God created us to feel lonely? Sometimes a friend or someone we love might hurt our feelings. Do you think that's what God meant for us? 
No. And are things the way they should be between us and God? No, they are not. And that's definitely not what God created us for, right? So things are not there how they're supposed to be. But it's not just with us as people. It's with the whole creation, right? I mean, it's with the whole every part of earth. Sometimes, some years, when farmers are growing crops, they don't get enough rain for the crops to grow well. And some years, there's too much rain, right? Or sometimes, like, really big things happen, like earthquakes or just terrible things. And you think, is that how God meant it to be? Anyone? It is not how God meant it to be. So that is the bad news. But thankfully, we have really good news, which is what we've been talking about in worship today. And so you might have noticed this. The good news is that even though things are not the way they're supposed to be, God is not leaving it like that. He has a plan, and he's already working to make everything right again, right? Yes. So Jesus today the theme of our worship is that he is the great reconciler of heaven and earth did you hear mr matt say what it means to reconcile do you know what it means to be reconciled to someone does anyone know so like if if you did say have a friend and maybe something didn't go well and you hurt each other's feelings but then you apologized right and you made things right Uh uh-huh and you were friends again you're reconciled you're how you're supposed to be, right? You're in the right relationship. So I'm pretty sure you hear, if you're, if, if you're here on a regular basis, we talk every week about how Jesus is the one who makes things right between us and God, right? Because we can't do that ourselves. And so Jesus came, and he lived, and he died, and he rose again, so we can be right with God, right? And that's the best news of all. Because that is by far our biggest problem. And so that is wonderful, wonderful news that we're right with God. We can be reconciled with God if we trust in Jesus. But it's even bigger than that. God is not stopping at reconciling us with himself, which is pretty amazing. One day, all of earth is going to be reconciled with heaven too. And that means every single thing that is wrong on earth is going to be right. That means no more plants that don't grow right, no more um, no, no more bad storms that hurt people, nothing. Like any bad thing, any corner, teeny tiny bit of the universe that is not working how it's supposed to be is going to be made right again because Jesus has promised to make everything right again. And so that means everything is going to be exactly how it should be. And You know, that is, will pets be back? So that is a great question that we talk about a lot. You know what, Josie? So um, the Bible doesn't tell us specifically about that, but God created animals as part of his creation, and he called them good, and he gave them to us for us to love, and they bring us joy. So he's going to make that right again. And I don't know exactly how, but that is definitely part of it because animals are part of God's creation, right? And they're amazing, and we love them. So they're definitely not going to be left out of all this amazing things being right. Do you, yes. You know what? We don't have I'm sorry. I know. That is a great question, and I think anyone who's ever loved a pet would like to know that. But you know what I think the short answer is, is that we can trust God for that because he loves us. And he has loved everything that he has ever made. Right? Right. So the good news that I want you all to think about this week, whenever something isn't how it's supposed to be, whether it's with you and God or, like, you and another person, or if you see something in creation that you know, like, that's not how it's supposed to be, I want you to remember the good news that it will be someday. And, in fact, Paul tells us in his letter to the Romans that the whole creation is groaning, waiting to be made right again. It's not just us that we're like, please, God, make it all right. The whole earth is just waiting, 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 because God promises us in his word 
that he will make it all right. And we can already trust that he will do that because we've already seen what Jesus is willing to do for us, right? So whatever comes your way this week, however sad or broken it seems, I want you to remember that there is not one bad or wrong thing that Jesus is not going to make right in the end. And so that means that we can live with hope, okay? Okay, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, you know we long to be reconciled to you, to each other. You know that we long to live in this world as you made it to be. And we thank you that we can trust that that will indeed happen one day because you promised us it will. And you have shown us that you are trustworthy and that you were willing to lay down your life to make that happen. And so we pray that you would continue to make all things new, and we look forward to the day when every single thing in creation is made right again. And we pray this in your son's name. Amen. Children, you may be dismissed to go downstairs. And as the ushers come forward to receive our in-person gifts, I invite you to give joyfully as new creations. As we uh, leaders in the church have been preparing for the coming year and uh, the budget, we've been so joy, 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 it's been joyful for us to think about all the ministries of this church and all of your involvement in them. The one ministry that we can all do and that we're all called into is, of course, this ministry of reconciliation. So let's thank the Lord for these gifts. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you have reconciled us to yourself in Christ. And we thank you that you have called us into this ministry of reconciliation, your great rescue mission to the world. Would you use these gifts, uh, these and those given online, and use us as your ambassadors for Christ uh, through the world, here and everywhere. And we thank you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we prepare to hear God's word preached in just a minute, I invite Andy Gear to come forward and lead us in our prayer of intercession. So I'd like to invite you to join your hearts with him as he prays for us. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your great mercy to all of us and to your church. Lord God, I pray that you would please provide for the English Libri, both financially and that the summer lectures and concerts would have a powerful impact on those who attend and even uh, England itself. Please be with Will and Gail Barker as Will has surgery to remove a kidney stone tomorrow. Please give them comfort that the surgery would be successful and that Will would recover quickly. And thank you, Lord, for the care you provided them from their children, their church, and their pastor. 
Please also be with Judy Leverett as she recovers from knee replacement surgery. Please give her and Jenny comfort and peace during this time. And please help her to have a quick recovery and improve mobility. And please be with Ryan as he manages the house in Jenny's absence. Please also be with Dot Branson's friend Peggy as she has additional surgery tomorrow for ovarian cancer. Please leave no trace of the cancer and help her heal quickly for the chemotherapy treatment that will follow. Thank you, Lord, for all the support she has received from her church. Lord, I pray that you would give strength, energy, and comfort to Larry and Marie Chambers as Larry has now returned from his hospital stay. Please be with them. Lord, we also pray for the Presbyterian Church in America that you would guide us in the peace, unity, and grace of Christ. Please revive our hearts and draw us closer to you. Lord God, please also be with the Nigerian church as 46 Christians were recently killed there. Lord, I ask that you'd please bring comfort to their families and please move the hearts of those in government to protect the people of Nigeria. Lord, also we pray for the families of the 40 Christian students killed in Uganda last Friday. Please give them comfort and peace. We pray, Lord, that you come quickly and bring justice and mercy for your people throughout the world. In your holy and precious name, Lord Jesus, amen. Let's stand and sing one more time.
Lord, we extend highest honor and praises to your name. We thank you for who you are. And we pray that you would open your word now to us. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, please be seated. Well, today, in this uh, series in Revelation, the troubles of the Old Testament are going to catch up to us here in the New Testament. If you have ever wondered, why did God destroy the world by a flood in the days of Noah? Or if you have ever wondered, why did God destroy those ancient cities of Sodom and Gomorrah with their smoke going up to the skies forever and ever? If you have ever wondered, why did God threaten to destroy Nineveh in those days of Jonah? Or if you have ever wondered, why did God destroy Jerusalem and his own temple there in the year 587 B.C.? Perhaps you have wondered, why did God destroy Jerusalem again and its second temple in the year 70 A.D.? If these questions from the Old Testament of God's judgments uh, are troubling to you, you're going to have the same troubles with today's passage because God is proving himself to be the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same with regard to his stance against sin, against wickedness, against evil prevailing upon the earth. At various times and in various places, God has sent judgment upon the earth. Not a uh, personal and final and eternal judgment for sins, but a temporary act of judgment upon the earth, a course correction that we would turn from things that are wrong, that are absolutely wrong, and return to God's standards for how He has established life upon the earth. If you've had trouble with those judgments of the Old Testament, you have to revisit them again today. And in our own culture and context, we ought to just go ahead and recognize we have great difficulty in this 21st century. We have great difficulty conceiving of righteous judgment. We now live in a world where a great many people reject the concept of absolute truth, that there can be one moral standard that applies to everyone. We now live in a world where judgment is reduced to nothing more than the will of the powerful. In a world where judgment becomes arbitrary, the one who would deliver severe judgments is thought to be cruel, oppressive, and hateful. And we're speaking of God, the judge of all the earth, who always does what is right. Nothing could be further from the truth. His judgments are not cruel. They are not oppressive or hateful. They are indicators of what's needed. Severe mercies to correct a course uh, that is surely headed for disaster. We're jumping into Revelation chapter 9 today. If you'd like to pull out a Bible uh, in one of our pew Bibles, it's page 1033. Our text today includes some of the most terrifying pronouncements of judgment in all of Scripture. So brace yourself for these. Four trumpets have been sounded. If I could just remind us where we are in the book of Revelation. First, there, were, there was a scroll that needed to be opened, and the scroll was going to reveal the mystery, something kept hidden, of how God was going to do this. How is He going to unite heaven and earth? How is He going to restore this creation of his that is so severely tainted by sin and wickedness, rebellion and rejection of him. How is he going to do it? Well, it's in the scroll, and as the seals of the scroll begin to be opened, all seven of them, that becomes a, a literary device for telling us about human history. And we had the uh, seven seals, which were uh, indicators of what's happening in history. We get all the way to the sixth seal, which is a seal of God's wrath, and then the seventh seal kind of backs up, and it's as if we're uh, 
kind of going in circles around this thing, dialing it in closer and closer, the seven seals didn't tell us much about judgment. We went right from uh, the horsemen, who I guess are symbols of judgment, to this day of wrath. But now with the trumpets, we're getting a lot of judgment. The first four trumpets are judgments upon the earth, the dwelling place of man. And now we come to the final three trumpets. Technically, we're only going to deal with five and six today. But these trumpets are judgments upon mankind. The fifth and sixth blast of judgment will reveal more fully what is in the heart of God, what is in the heart of man. In fact, uh, three things are going to be revealed. Something's going to be revealed about these fallen angels, uh, demonic hosts. Something's going to be revealed about the human heart. And then finally, something's going to be revealed about the Lord's people. Let's take, um, let's take up this reading. Embrace yourselves for it. I'm going to back up to uh, chapter 8, the last verse, verse 13, because it kind of announces these final three trumpet calls. Then I looked, and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blasts of the other three trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth. They were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. And in those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. In appearance, the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces, their hair like women's hair, and their teeth like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. They have tails and stings like scorpions, and their power to hurt people for five months is in their tails. They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon. And in Greek, he is called Apollyon. The first woe has passed. Behold, two woes are still to come. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet. And I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number. And this is how I saw the horses in my vision and those who rode them. They wore breastplates the color of fire, and of sapphire and of sulfur, and the heads of the horses were like lion's heads, and fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents with heads, and by means of them they wound. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent 
of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders, of their sorceries, or their sexual immorality, or their thefts. Thus far the reading of God's Word. Terrifying judgments. The fifth and the sixth trumpet blast. What are we to make of these things? Well, if we just back away for a moment from all the symbols and uh, imagery, the, the complex of terrifying thoughts, uh, we can step back to a simple statement in the book of Ecclesiastes that summarizes it all. I'll put this on the screen. Uh, Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14, long ago, the prophet said this, the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Not a new word, a very old one. And in the book of Revelation, uh, John is seeing the uh, ultimate and final fulfillment of these words from God that have stood for centuries through the ages. God is bringing these judgments, and it becomes clear as you get to the final verse, verse 21, why is He doing this? Uh, 20 and 21, why is God doing these things? He wants the whole world to repent. He wants every person everywhere to turn away from things that He has declared to be morally bankrupt, wrong evil against his own character, against against his intention in creating uh, this earth that we live upon. He wants all people everywhere to give up their idolatry, choosing to worship things that are not God. He wants all people everywhere to give up their murderous ways, their immorality of all kinds. And here, sexual immorality is junk drawer category term for all things that are outside of a marriage commitment between one man and one woman. It's the word porneia. God wants us to give all that up. He wants us to give up our thefts. But people won't do it. People won't do it. Even when backed into a corner, even when fierce, intense Judgments like these are being poured out upon them. They won't relent. Let's back up and uh, consider what these trumpet calls and all these images mean. Uh, Here's a depiction of the fifth trumpet from the uh, 12th century. And uh, just as we as we return to the text, while we're, if you want to pull up that next slide, here's an, an image from the 12th century. This is an illuminated manuscript. We have no idea who actually created this, probably of uh, English origin. But you can see visually all the things depicted there in verses 1 to 11. Uh, verses 1 to 6 are somewhat kind of plainly stated what's happening. And then 7 and 11 kind of give us, I don't know, more terrifying symbols of what's going on. So we might interpret this judgment, uh, the main idea of it being something to do with locusts. This is a judgment of stinging locusts, right? And we need to understand that there is this uh, fallen angel. And Jesus told us similar things in uh, the Gospel of Luke. He declared, I saw Satan fall like lightning. So here we have a fallen angel. We don't have any more description than that, except that he holds a key to the bottomless pit, the abyss. He's going to open it. Things have been trapped in there, trapped in the abyss. One occasion, uh, Jesus encountered a man uh, who was demon-possessed, and the demons who possessed him declared that their name collectively was Legion. 
for we are many. And if you know this story, when Jesus crossed the lake uh, to the, the Gentile side uh, and encountered this man who was terrifying, who had, was afflicted in so many ways, he had all these demons possessing him and tormenting him. And when Jesus spoke to the demons, they begged him, do not send us into the abyss. They knew something. Perhaps this is the same abyss, a place where um, many of these hosts of fallen angels have been imprisoned. Well, they're going to be let loose. And when they are let loose, they're described as a plague of locusts. This plague of locusts does not come to destroy the vegetation of the earth. It's much more terrifying than that. Rather than eating up every bit of green grass or leaves on the trees, the only thing they're after are human beings. And the locust image is then replaced for one of a scorpion. I hope uh, no one here has had the unfortunate, um, uh, unfortunate event of being stung by a scorpion. But the main thing you need to know about that is that it is terribly painful. Some scorpion bites have been uh, equated to being struck by lightning for pain. Uh, a pain that can endure for a long time. So this is a picture of of demons like locusts who are inflicting great pain on human beings. There's a couple of hopeful uh, words. I'll come back to those in a minute. But uh, here's a, a visual of locusts. In our part of the world, we don't see locusts much, but in the Middle East, they sure do. This is uh, a swarm of locusts. You see how thick they are? A swarm of locusts uh, captured by some photographer several years ago. But um, locusts, when they swarm, and, and when there are so many of them, I mean, it's truly terrifying. Uh, a few years ago, in 2020, there was a great plague of locusts in Kenya. And they tried to record how thick and how wide like, was this swarm of locusts. And one report, this is, these numbers are real, one report was that the swarm of locusts was 25 miles long and 37 miles wide. They ate everything. So that's, the, that's the, the vision we're getting here of what this release of these demonic powers is going to be like. Like locusts for number. You can't count them. They fill the sky. They're everywhere. You can't get away from them. It's going to be something terrible. A, a swarm of locusts like that would be large enough to blanket one of the major cities of the earth, say the city of Paris, 24 times over. So the picture here is of innumerable hordes of demonic powers coming to inflict pain, to torment people. It's terrifying. It is truly terrifying. But there are a couple of hopeful things that we can point out. One, the duration of this plague is limited. We get a very specific number repeated twice for five months. This is going to happen. And the other very hopeful thing that is given to us is uh, in verse 4. You should take, maybe it's hopeful. I, this is a good news, bad news thing, Megan. I don't know what you want first. I'll give you the bad news. The bad news is that God's people, the church, are still on the earth when this happens. We're there for this plague. And we know that because in verse 4 it says, they're told that they are to uh, only harm people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So that's the good news. The bad news, the church is going to live through this. We're going to be on the earth in these days. The good news, if you have the seal of God on your foreheads, this plague, uh, the, this, this pain, these scorpion bites will not afflict you. What is the seal of God? on your forehead. Do you have it? I hope you do. When we baptize, we take water, a symbol of the spiritual reality of what God is doing. And not only do we apply that to uh, your forehead, but we also apply the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is a way of saying the ones who belong to the Lord. The ones who belong to the Lord will be kept safe. 
But this is the plague. And what is being revealed here? If you want to go to the next slide. What's being revealed here in this fifth plague? Well, what's being revealed is uh, this demonic venom. Demons have been loose on the earth. We, uh, the scriptures teach us that Satan is a real being created by God, a fallen angel, but he is not alone. An innumerable host have been kept in prison in the abyss. And now when they are released, what is revealed is their true intention in all of the deceptions that Satan has plied against humankind. He has tried to present us with this idea that he will liberate us. Liberate us from having to do what God says. Liberate us from following God's rules. That we can have any kind of life we want for ourselves and do anything we please. Well, when this day finally comes, the true intentions of all of these fallen angels will be revealed. Their true intentions are to inflict pain. That's what all their lies are about. They're not liberating anyone. They're inflicting great pain upon us as they convince us that God is a liar, that we shouldn't honor his word or do what he says. Nothing could be further from the truth. But this is what's going to be revealed uh, as this fifth trumpet sounds and this terrifying judgment is revealed that all of the people of the earth who have trusted in the lies of Satan and of this demonic influence, it's going to be revealed. The ones they've been listening to have only been after one thing, pain, inflicting pain upon God's creation, upon God himself. That's what's going to be revealed. What are we supposed to do about this? What then shall we do? What is this, what's the lesson in this fifth trumpet? We ought to remember the urgency of God's mission. Jesus came to the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world. Jesus came because he recognized what great peril we were in what great need we were in. Like sheep without a shepherd, he had compassion upon the people. He came that we might know the truth, that the truth might set us free. And he left so that we might do greater things than he did. Greater things, not in terms of uh, greater miracles being performed by individual Christians, but greater things because as Jesus was located only in one place at one time, his church is located in every place all the time. Throughout 20 centuries, the church has been declaring the truth of who God is. Old Orchard Church exists to be a demonstration of who God is, a God of grace, a God of truth, a God of beauty, a God who declares mercy shall triumph over judgment. We are to do whatever we can to call people out of the lies that they are trapped in, to lead them to the Lord who will love them with a great love. We should remember the urgency of this mission. The story is going somewhere. It's going somewhere fast. And while there is time, people need to return to the Lord. We're to be in the world as Jesus was in the world. There are more terrifying things in that vision that I don't understand. As you get down to uh, verse 7 through 11, you have many uh, descriptors, many uh, images being piled on top of each other. The, the sum of all of that is terror, sheer terror. I don't know what those creatures are or why they're being described like that. I just know this is a warning. And when, if we begin to see things that look like this might be happening... Uh, we should know that the end is very near. We should be warning people that God has written the end of the story and they can all read it. Here it is. So these uh, terrifying vision, this fifth trumpet ends uh, with the recognition that there is a king over the locust scorpion demons. There is a king. He is the one who has opened up the bottomless pit, the abyss. His name is Abaddon. In Hebrew, Apollyon in Greek, both of those words mean the same thing, destruction. 
the one who is supremely bent on destruction. Perhaps this is Satan. We don't know for sure, but it is certainly someone, uh, a demonic power, a fallen angel, closely allied with him. Destruction. The first woe has passed. There are two more to come. We've shifted. The first four trumpets were upon the, inhabit- the, the dwelling place of man, upon the earth. But these final judgments are directed against mankind. Um, so if, if the locusts weren't terrifying enough, and I think they are. You know, in our family, we've been introducing Josie to the Indiana Jones movies. And you know how, uh, if you know the, any of the movies, there's always like this terrifying scene of something you're afraid of. So snakes, why did it have to be snakes? And then there's rats in another movie. I hope I'm not ruining things for you. There are spiders. Every movie gets its own kind of little mini plague. Well, that's what this one has been, this mini plague of locusts. Of course, Indiana Jones always survives. Here comes another one. And this one is beyond, beyond Hollywood. I, I don't know. This one's truly terrifying. So we come to the sixth trumpet. Um, I've got a, a picture of this one too, again from the 13th century, the same illuminated manuscript. And you can see the angel is blowing the trumpet. Um, you can see something that's supposed to represent the altar up at the top center and the voice calling out from the altar, it's time to release these four angels. These four angels have the appointed task of of bringing death upon the earth. They uh, are going to kill a third of mankind. We don't know for sure why there are four of them, but probably because the number four is often used in Revelation as a symbol for the earth, for for covering the totality of the earth, right? We still have that expression, the four corners of the globe. So these angels are going out to cover the entire earth, all four corners. Perhaps there's something in this that's supposed to uh, remind us of the great plagues uh, in Egypt. When Moses was appearing before Pharaoh and begging Pharaoh, Yahweh, the God of heaven and earth, is saying to you, let my people go. And if you will not do this, These plagues will be visited upon you and your household and your nation. And the last and the greatest plague is the angel of death who takes the firstborn from every household. This is something even more terrifying. Four angels of death, and they are going to strike down one-third of mankind. I don't know if anything like this has ever happened in the history of the earth when so many people have been killed at once. Perhaps the, the, uh, the great plagues of the Middle Ages, but in more modern times, we might think of World War II as being a, ter- a terrible and devastating war that killed a great many people. Um, by the calculations I've seen, um, three to four percent of the inhabitants of the earth were killed in World War II. So this is something that's on a magnitude of 10 times greater We get down to uh, verses 16 to 19, and we get more terrifying symbols. So again, it's kind of plainly stated what's going to happen, and then we get these more terrifying symbols. Um, Now the image changes from four angels to 200,000 mounted uh, troops, cavalry. And just putting ourselves back in the shoes of the first century audience again, so the locusts were terrifying. This is another picture that's terrifying. I want to show you something from history. Uh, This is a structure in Rome, this next slide, called Trajan's Column. It's it's a tower. But the unique thing about this tower, and this was constructed um, in the year, I think it was finished in the year 113. So it's the same time frame uh, as Revelation. Within 15, 20 years, this tower is being constructed. I'm suggesting to you that Revelation is written under an emperor called Domitian. The next emperor was Trajan, and he was successful in some battles that he fought, and he built this thing uh, to commemorate his victories 
or perhaps as a bit of Roman propaganda, uh, not exactly telling the truth, but instilling fear in all the people. So this, this huge structure, and if you could see it up close, there is um, like a sculpture that goes all the way around it, spiraling upward. It's, a, it's a, called a frieze, and it spirals around that thing 25 times from the ground to the top. And it's got all these scenes in it. I want to show you one of them. So this next slide is one of the scenes. And um, what you need to notice here is that all those figures uh, on the right-hand side that look like they're running away, those are heavy cavalry. The, the Greek word, which we actually have in our text, uh, is the word cataphract. A cataphract translates to um, uh, armored all around. So there, there are these horsemen that are armored all the way around. The horses are wearing armor. The riders are wearing armor. And this was a fearsome um, you know, military development in the, in the first century or perhaps a bit before that. If you went to the eastern edge of the Roman Empire, the Euphrates River, on the other side of the Euphrates River were a fearsome people, the Parthians. And the Parthians were often at war with Rome. In the year uh, 53 BC, there was perhaps the greatest military victory over Rome that ever happened. The Parthians had a, a, a contingent of 1,000 of these cataphracts, heavily armored um, like knights on horseback, and they had another 9,000 heavily armored um, archers. And with their 10,000 units, they overpowered 40,000 Roman legionnaires. So outnumbered, four to one. And they won. And they instilled fear in the lives of everyone who lived in Asia Minor, this province where these seven churches are, um, close to the Euphrates River, on the other side of that river, to the east were these terrifying forces that one day might come and wipe out Rome. And so this is the picture that is being used in this first century to describe the, these four angels who are at the Euphrates River. Let's get into more detail here. Imagine 200,000 of these heavily armored uh, cataphracts coming across the river and into Rome. That's, that's maybe what he's drawing on. So two terrifying images for the first century, a plague of locusts and this impossibly large army. I don't know that the world had ever seen an army of 200,000 cavalry, but that's what's being described here. So a terrifying scene. What's being shown to us? Well, here with this trumpet blast, uh, we, we want to understand the terror of what's happening a third of mankind is going to be wiped out. But then we get these very important interpreting verses, verses 20 and 21, which tell us even after this terrible plague, people didn't return to the Lord. They didn't recognize that it was their sin that had brought this upon them. They didn't recognize that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The God who revealed the Ten Commandments. And remember, Back in those days with Moses at Mount Sinai when the Ten Commandments were revealed, Israel didn't say, wow, what strange rules you came up with. Israel didn't say, what arbitrary thoughts. How would anyone ever know that that is a standard for morality? Israel said, it's good, and we will do it. Because that law is already written on our human hearts. We had everything we needed to recognize that it was good and worthy of all of our aspirations. And so even when a terrible plague like this befalls mankind, we get those very sobering words in verse 20. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent. Those might be the saddest words in all of Scripture. What then? could cause them to repent. What is being shown to us? What is being shown to us with this sixth trumpet? The hardening of the human heart. Our hearts are being hardened against God and against His Word. 
when brought to utter ruin, mankind still will not repent. At the end of the story, the vast majority, the hosts of the earth, of all the nations, have become just like Pharaoh. Pharaoh hardened his heart and would not let God's people go. Even after all of the plagues were visited upon him, and something like that is going to happen on a global scale with every individual. And people will not repent. What should we do? I think this is a call to prayer, if there ever was one. If any soul is going to be saved, it's not going to be because of your wisdom or your eloquence or your persuasive words or because you showed them exactly what it says in the book of Revelation. If any soul is going to be brought to salvation, it's going to be the work of God. Our hearts are set against Him. Jesus taught us that no man can come to Him unless the Father draw Him. Will we commit ourselves to prayer? What else can we do? Salvation depends on the work of the Holy Spirit granting us a gift of faith that we might turn from the worthlessness of other ideas, of other competing worldviews, that we might turn away from the deceptions of Satan and recognize that God is good. He's been good all along. He's been holding out His hands to an obstinate people. What shall we do in light of this revelation that even the most fearsome and terrifying plague that God could visit upon the earth will not cause people to return to Him. We should commit ourselves to prayer. We should be a praying church, recognizing that first and foremost, prayer is the work. We ought to be asking the Lord to bring people in, into His churches, that they might be spared these terrible things that have been declared, that are surely coming to pass. A third thing perhaps is revealed if we just step back a bit further and remember uh, the audience of this book. This book is being delivered to a church that is oppressed, that is persecuted, a church with lots of questions. Is the kingdom going to come? Why does it feel that the world has all the power and we have none? Why does it feel that the leaders of the earth care nothing for the gospel? Why does it feel that the emperor in Rome is more concerned about being worshipped himself than about turning the hearts of all people everywhere to the one true God and Savior who can redeem them from all of their sins? Another lesson to be learned is that uh, this book has been entrusted to the church. And many times throughout this letter, we are being challenged to overcome. To the one who overcomes, great things have been promised. All the blessings of this book. And so what's being revealed to us is that there are a people scattered throughout the earth. Jesus declared them to be salt and to be light. There are a people who are the overcomers, the true disciples, who will not be cowed into silence, who will not be turned away from their Savior to embrace lesser things. There are a people who will overcome. And the lesson for us, if we would be numbered among them, knowing that these things are going to come, we've been prepared in advance. We've been prepared that we might remain true to our Savior. He hasn't yet been shown to us, but soon, in just a few more chapters, we'll see Christ coming. Not as He came the first time, but on a white horse this time, with a sword from his mouth, the sword of his word. And we're to remain true to him. A third thing that's being revealed, in spite of such terrible times that have come and that will come, in spite of persecution, as today we prayed for Christians in Nigeria, for Christians in Uganda, for Christians who are in desperate situations, There is a group of people who will overcome. 
And they will do it not by their own strength or might, not because they will be immune from all suffering, but because they understand that they've been marked by God and He knows how to keep His precious loved ones safe. They will remain true to Him. Remaining true means that we continue to bear some resemblance to our Savior. And I would charge you to remember the compassion of Christ as He looked out over Jerusalem, the compassion that He had. And I would charge you to cultivate that kind of compassion. The book of uh, Jude, written by one of Jesus' uh, half-brothers, right, a brother by Mary, uh, ends with a, a little string of admonitions telling us to do what we can to snatch others from the fire and to show mercy. And it charges us, uh, Jude verse 23, I've been, I've been reading out Jude verse 24 as our uh, benediction through this series, but the verse just before that, verse 23, charges us to show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Jesus found a way to extend mercy and compassion and grace without denying the truth, without neglecting to call people back to a, li a life that honors God, a life that recognizes that He's called us to be a righteous people who bear His name. In light of these terrifying visions, I want to invite you to turn your gaze back to Jesus and remember that as He was in the world, we're called to be in the world as well, knowing that He's with us. He has not left us as orphans, but He is with us now, and He's given us His promise that soon He is coming and that all will be well. Would you pray with me? Lord, we come before you having considered uh, the terrors of your word. And I pray that if there is anyone here in our midst who does not have confidence that your name has been sealed upon their forehead, if there's anyone here who does not have confidence that you are a God of mercy and that you will save the one who calls out, if there's anyone here who doesn't have assurance that there is one name given among men by which we must be saved, if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, Jesus, as the one who can cleanse us from all our sin, the one who makes us pure and spotless, the one who enables us to persevere and to overcome, I pray that you would draw such a one to yourself. And for the rest of us, would you help us to be in the world, even as you were in the world? Would you grant us urgency for your mission? Would you grant us a heart that will pray fervently and often that your will would be done, that your kingdom would come, and that there would yet be many sons and daughters brought into that kingdom? And would you help us to remain engaged in this world, not to consign it over to destruction, but fill our hearts with compassion for those who are lost, those who are trapped, those who are without hope in the world. Lord, would you move your church here and everywhere to be about the business of declaring your kingdom and of welcoming people in. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, let's come to the Lord's table. If you would uh, stand, we'll make our circle around the room. Let this humble supper, this bread and this cup be a reminder to you that the Lord has committed himself to his people that there is safety in Christ, 
that although uh, we may be made to pass through the waters, they will not overwhelm us, although we may live to see such terrifying times. The God of Jacob will be our fortress. Let these uh, symbols be a sign and seal to you of the Lord's love, of his protection, that nothing can take you out of his hand. We remember on the night that Jesus was betrayed, that he gathered his disciples to himself, that he explained to them, this bread is my body given for you. After giving thanks, he broke it. And he said, take and eat. We remember that he took the cup and explained, this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink of it, all of you. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. If your faith is in Christ, uh, please partake with us in this spiritual meal. If you're not certain of the claims of Christ or the place that he has in your life, simply let these things pass you by and please don't feel embarrassed to do that. We're glad to have you with us. Let's partake together of the grace of God for the people of God.
Lord, we thank you for your word over us. We thank you that we can touch and taste and receive it deeply. And I pray that uh, this word of your commitment to your people, of your love for us, uh, would go with us into this week. Would you help us as you've given us this ministry of reconciliation? Would you help us to point the people that we know, the people that we are in contact with, would you help us to point them to you, that they might be spared uh, these terrifying judgments. Uh, we pray that you'd strengthen us for this mission. We pray that you'd, that you'd move us to pray. We pray that you'd fill us with your own compassion. Uh, we thank you that it's your good pleasure to do so, that mercy triumphs over judgment. Uh, help us to see that even in these coming days. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Receive the Lord's blessing. And now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. And let his people say, Amen. 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 I am hopeful the Lord will lead us through uh, this series on Revelation. Uh, there's more hard pieces coming, but thank you for uh, bearing with me and with God's Word. Uh, we do like to take a moment for celebrating around the circle. Uh, I've got a few pictures to share, and then, of course, we can take anything you have from the floor. Uh, firstly, I just wanted to recognize what a great time we had on Wednesday night with the cookout and the concert that happened here. Uh, if you weren't able to make it, it was just a great time of coming together. Um, I think there were around 74 people, so it was kind of a, a big coming together. And what I don't want us to lose sight of is that that was a thank you from the uh, singing group Java Jive. They've been using our facilities for, I don't know, since the pandemic, maybe three years. And we haven't charged them, we just said, come in and sing. And so they wanted to thank us for that. So that was a celebration in itself of uh, thanking our church for being a hospitable place and encouraging good music. Um, another thing that happened this week, uh, just yesterday, we might have a picture for this one. Uh, we packed a truck and we sent off our friends, Donnie and Veronica, for Richmond. So uh, we were able to celebrate that we got everything into that truck, which was, I think, an act of God's grace. <laughs> but um, thanks to all of you who've been uh, praying for their transition and uh, please continue to pray for them as they, they land in Richmond. And um, I had one other, one other, one or two quick announcements, but before we get to those, is there anything you would like to share in terms of celebrations? Who are you pointing at? Oh, the flowers, right. These flowers were a gift to us this morning. I nearly forgot. One of our neighbors, um, I, I wrote this down, Jenny Mullen? I can't, I wrote it down somewhere, but our neighbors just down the street, it's 657, Amelia brought the flowers this morning for church and left a note and said, please use the flowers in worship. So, Janie, okay, Janie, so maybe you know a little more about that, Becca. Okay, the flowers are a gift 
from a neighbor. Um, all right. Are there other things to share, Gretchen? Okay. Welcome. So good to have you with us today. So take a moment to greet them if you're able. Anything else to share this morning? All right. Um, if you can't hear in the back, Margaret's sister Katie is visiting us today. Welcome, Katie. Thanks for coming. A couple of quick things. We have a congregational meeting on Wednesday, so please come. Um, and there are also a few tents in the lawn that need to come down. So if you can lend us 15 minutes, it'll be quick pulling those down if you've got the ability to stay and help with the tents. I think that's everything for today. Thank you for being with us. Uh, go now in grace and in peace.